and then share my screen. If you didn't get them, there's two handouts in the back um, on the week 10 folder. They correspond to this quizpractice.pdf and this questions.pdf file. The quiz practice uh, is basically what the uh, format of the quiz is going to be again on uh, this coming Monday is when the quiz will be. And uh, so there'll be five questions, each worth three points. I've clarified the instructions up here of what to do for each problem based on questions that, uh, good questions that people asked in class. Uh, but uh, otherwise it's the, the same exact format, uh, the rules about what you're allowed to do, any sort of notes that you wanna use, whether they're handwritten, printed, or uh, including electronic this time on the computer, you'll have access to your computer to browse the internet, look at uh, the Postgres documentation. But uh, the thing that you will not be able to do on your computer, and I will uh, have to trust you all on this, you may not both uh, communicate with another being, or more importantly, actually connect to Postgres and run the commands. So you have to uh, be able to interpret these things uh, uh, using, using the, the references. Um, four of these, yeah, there's five problems again. The problems are all, uh, the way that I've generated these practice problems is I just uh, picked out of those, I don't know, 60 or 70 different uh, problems in the previous handout, I picked one of those as the base and then just added some uh, sort of noise lines that are uh, meant to make it just not exactly obvious which one of the base problems it's related to. So each one of these problems is a little bit longer than the previous ones, uh, but the concepts are all exactly the same. And um, you might just see like an unneeded unique constraint or something, or there might be some extra inserts that, that, that don't affect the main point of each of these problems. Um, but otherwise, the, uh, the problems all follow the same format as the, uh, as the notes. And again, anything from the notes is fair game on this particular quiz. Joey. So we can uh, use like our notes packet as handwritten notes? Yes, and so the question is, can you use your notes packet? And the answer is yes. Um, you can feel free to reference anything at all that you want. Anything uh, that is created before the beginning of the quiz, um, fair game to use. Good question. Any other questions about administrative thing about the quiz? Uh, Quiz will be in class. Um, you'll have the first 10 minutes of class to complete the quiz. I will be here approximately 20 minutes to a half hour early for anybody who wants or needs extra time. Um, so it shouldn't be like a time constrained thing at all for everybody. Good questions. Any other questions? Okay. So, um, you know, the last week we've been talking about all these different uh, lock uh, things in class and in Postgres, uh, well, and locks in general are related to what's called concurrency control. So this CC right here stands for concurrency control. And the way that Postgres implements uh, concurrency control is called MVCC or multi-version con concurrency control. And uh, this, Today in class and uh, uh, probably a little bit on Friday too, we're gonna talk a little bit about the implementation details of MVCC. And um, if this were a computer science class, we would talk a lot about the implementation details. One of the things that I consider to be the differences between say like computer science and data science is computer science is about like ensuring the integrity of data, ensuring that you have access to the correct data. And this MVCC concept is really about the integrity of data. Data science, on the other hand, we're just sort of assuming mostly that the, the data is correct, uh, that the, uh, the computer has correctly stored the data for us, and we're focusing on using the data. So we're gonna talk just enough about this concept in order to be able to talk about uh, uh, the next concept that we'll get to next week, which is making our select queries fast. Um, and we'll need to just know a little bit about this in order to do that. Um, for 
yeah, the, I guess the reference material for this material is this book uh, right here posted online, um, interdb.jp. This uh, book, yes, yeah, it's called The Internals of Postgres, a very famous book in the database world. And uh, you'll notice since it has the .jp extension on there, it's written by a Japanese person. Uh, so again, mentioned this before, Postgres, very international project, people from all over the world uh, working on it, collaborating together. And uh, so in this case, we're going to be using uh, this Japanese reference. Uh, actually, starting next week, we'll be switching to a Russian reference. Um, one of the, I don't know, interesting side notes of this uh, book is that if you read the copyright information, everybody in the world is allowed to use it unless you work at Amazon. I don't know why this author doesn't like Amazon, but if you work at Amazon, you're not allowed to read this book. Um, in, uh, yeah, so this little table right here, this graph shows what the, let's zoom this in a little bit, uh, sort of the big picture concepts that this book covers. Uh, at least at this point in the class, what we're doing is we're going down this little uh, hierarchy tree right here. That this is gonna be the hierarchy tree that's important for us to understand for making our queries uh, really, really fast. The other, um, the other concepts, again, focusing more on the computer science focused stuff, and this one here really getting into the, the data science applications. One of the difficulties about uh, this section of the class is that uh, the material, I think, is very interesting, but it is very hard to assess a student's knowledge of the material, or there's no like sort of fun way to assess the student's knowledge. Um, that like a lot of our previous assessments have, I know, involved cool programming assignments where you're actually doing something cool. Um, unfortunately, there's not going to be like a cool programming assignment associated with this. There's just going to be a bunch of um, basically true or false questions associated with this section of the class. And this uh, second handout, um, questions on table storage, again, in the GitHub repo corresponds to the questions.pdf file. Um, this handout is uh, basically how your assessment is going to work on this section of the class. In this uh, PDF file, there's, I don't know, 40 some different true or false problems. Um, inside the actual LaTeX source code, uh, it contains the, the answers to all these, so you can uh, view what the answers are going to be. There's no need to submit this at all, uh, but on your final exam, you will have questions that are uh, essentially drawn from this question bank with very minor changes to it. Uh, so if you can understand how to answer these questions, then you'll understand how to do well on this portion of the final exam. Um, for, yeah, for this, uh, these uh, sorts of questions here, about half the material we will explicitly cover in class and the other half of the material is things that will be uh, inside of these reference materials. And my expectation is that you will uh, read through all of these uh, chapters in uh, the book that are, that are required that, um, or that are the reference for this section. And one of the main purposes of this class is to give you the, like the, the in-class session of this class is to give you the sort of framework background understanding to understand the details of the, of the reading itself. Before we get into the actual technical stuff, any questions about what to expect or anything admin-wise questions? Okay. Um, then yeah, maybe uh, one last note before we get started. Again, the, um, the purpose of this discussion is really so that starting uh, next week, probably Monday, we'll be getting into making our SQL queries really fast and we'll need to, uh, to understand just this background knowledge in, in order to be able to do it. 
Okay, so this first uh, chapter, uh, this uh, database cluster, databases and tables, I think I have it open here, yes. Um, all of these chapters are, I don't know, relatively short. You could probably uh, read each one in uh, just an hour or so. Uh, uh, but uh, key things in each of these to keep in mind are these uh, bolded terms, good source of questions for the final. But in particular, in Postgres, uh, database cluster is maybe not what you're thinking of. When you hear the word cluster, you might think multiple computers working together. But in Postgres, the word cluster specifically refers to one instance of Postgres. And inside of one instance of Postgres, you can have many different databases inside that one computer. And so this diagram right here uh, sort of just describes that, that this cylinder over here is just an individual computer and it has multiple databases on it. Again, as you're reading through, um, through these, the, the figures are really the things that you wanna focus on. And in class, I'm going to highlight the particularly important figures that you wanna make sure that you 100% fully understand. Um, so this is one of those figures to make sure that you understand. In order to illustrate this idea of uh, the database cluster, I'm going to come over here to our uh, terminal and let's open up a, uh, a Postgres instance, there we go, so sort of run Postgres, we saw this command uh, before to get it to run, here's our hash, and let's see, three, two, let's go ahead and do it in psql dash dash user equals Postgres, there we go, and if you type backslash L in, uh, and psql, it lists all of the databases in your database cluster. There's always going to be at least three of these databases. Template zero and template one are uh, the sort of behind the scenes doing stuff. And then the default database that you're actually working with is Postgres. Uh, anytime I create a table or yeah, do anything, uh, it'll, it'll be going into this Postgres database unless I do something different about it. Um, that's, yes, let's see. So the next major concept is the idea of an OID. And every, uh, every relation or something that's more important than a relation is gonna have its own OID. Uh, so a database, something more important than a relation, so it has its own OID. Something like a tuple, a row, an entry inside of a uh, table not going to have an OID. Uh, these two commands right here showing just um, how, how you can get the OID for a particular database or for a particular relation. There's these two built-in uh, tables, PG database, PG class, and uh, uh, dat name contains the actual database name, OID, the OID. We'll go ahead and run this real quick. There we go. Semicolon. See the Postgres template one, template zero, the same things we had when we did the backslash L, but now it is giving us the actual OID number. And we'll be using this OID number here in a little bit to actually uh, navigate the files that Postgres is creating. Um, I'm going a little bit fast through all this, but if you, if you have questions, definitely feel free to, uh, to stop and ask. Okay. Uh, Yeah, good question. In general, anytime you have a command line program that uses a hash of some sort, um, so uh, we've seen two of those command line programs so far, Docker and Git. Um, Git uses hash hashes to reference individual commits. You can always just use a shortened version of the hash. As long as the hash is unique up to that point, you can just use that abbreviated version. And uh, so that's a super common, common thing to do. On, uh, on GitHub, if you see like the hashes ever listed, it usually only, it'll go up to uh, eight numbers because eight is it's like uh, unique enough that there's never been a collision on GitHub with uh, eight numbers but the hash itself has 256 numbers usually just to ensure that throughout the lifetime of the universe, there's an infinitesimal probability that there'll ever be a collision. Um, uh, 
Uh, good question. Okay. Uh, so yeah, the, the database has its own uh, OID number and then PG class stores all of the relations and, it's, uh, and those relations also have their own OID numbers. Up here, let's go ahead and do a create table T, something like we were doing in the, uh, uh, the, 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 the handout uh, that we went over last week. And now let's do select OID comma, oh, what's the rel name from PG underscore class. You can see there's a lot, a lot of different things inside of this PG underscore class. There's a lot of tables created by default in Postgres, um, but here's our T table that was just created and here's the OID. Uh, so the purpose of discussing that is so that we can talk a little bit about the physical structure of the database, which will be important for us to understand so that we know how much disk space all of our tables and relations are using. Um, so this figure here shows that uh, overall uh, structure. Back over here in the bottom, uh, um, bottom terminal down here, I'm gonna uh, open up the container but this time I'm going to go into uh, bash instead of into vSQL. And uh, there's this environment variable PG data, which is the location where the uh, Postgres is storing all of its data to, like the physical location on the hard drive. And so let's go in there and uh, here's an overview of this uh, information here. And one of the things that you'll need to be able to do for your uh, final exam is be able to reference this documentation and in particular this table right here to know like exactly what every single file is doing in that folder. So for example, if I ask you a question of say like, um, you need to change a particular configuration parameter, what file should you look at? You need to be able to look at this table here, say, oh, for configuration parameters, I need to go to postgresql.conf. Or if I ask you to, uh, um, what file controls Postgres's client authentication, then you look at this table and just find that. Um, so it should be relatively easy, you just need to know where to look up that sort of information. Um, here, inside of the, this PG data folder, uh, this base folder is what contains the actual data for all of our databases. And inside the base folder, there's a folder for each one of our actual databases. So back over here, type ls. Here is our base folder right here. Let's go into base, type ls. There's three folders inside of here, one for each one of those uh, databases that we have in our database cluster. And in order to know which one contains the T table, I have to look at the OIDs. Uh, Postgres always stores everything as a file uh, related to the OID um, for a number of reasons, but one example reason is it makes it much simpler to say like change the name of a table uh, because it doesn't affect the underlying OID representation. But here if we go into, uh, I created the table in the Postgres database, so this is the OID I want to go into, so CD13757, and these numbers they might be the same for you or they might be different. Um, and then I type ls and you can see there's a lot of different uh, numbers inside of here, a lot of different OIDs. And that's because, again, when I did that select star from PG class like this, there were a lot of different uh, relations, a lot of different tables inside of this database already. And so there's just a lot of things already stored inside of here. In order to, um, find the one associated with the T table. Here's the OID 16384. And uh, if I wanna say find how much disk space that particular table is actually using up, then the du-h command, we've seen that before to get the disk space. And then 16384 like that tells us that it's using up currently uh, zero bytes because we haven't put anything inside of it. Uh, I'm curious what yeah, great question. The question is, so what exactly is all of this other stuff doing? Um, so we've seen a little bit about the different types in Postgres. 
um, some of these other tables are storing information about those types. Uh, so one of the types that happened on, I believe, the last uh, midterm was uh, there was an INET, like for internet addresses. And so that's a custom type, not actually built into Postgres, but is stored in one of these tables. And um, when you first create the table or first create the database, it creates that for you uh, so that you have access to it. Um, uh, so it's just a lot of like kind of random administrative stuff like that. Uh, yeah, basically you never, I've never needed to actually like consider what's inside any of these tables before. Uh, and like what is explicitly hard coded into Postgres versus what is just like a, a sort of a special thing that sits on top of Postgres this way. Maybe one thing though that's worth doing, disk use dash h star, we can see just how much um, uh, like this dot, how much disk usage like all of this stuff put together is taking up. It's only uh, eight megabytes. So even though it looks like there's a lot of things here, it's really like, who cares? Um, but at this point, the important thing, zero bytes being used for this table because we haven't actually inserted anything inside yet. Good question, any other questions so far? Okay, uh, so the next, uh, let's see, so these sort of uh, queries down here, just sort of walking through the, the things that I've been doing. One thing that I will highlight though, is that, uh, and I've been doing this in all of our like, notes that I've been putting on GitHub, you'll notice that command line uh, commands, things that get typed into the shell, always starting with the dollar sign right here, so you know what is a command that got entered. No dollar sign here, so we know this was the output of this command. And then um, things here fit, this is the, the psql prompt, uh, has the database that we're connected to, and then the equals hashtag, and SQL command and then the output. So that's just how you can tell this means you're being entered into SQL. This means it's being um, typed directly into the terminal in bash. Uh, but I wanna skip down, let's see. I'm not gonna go over this concept of table spaces. This will be on the final exam. This will be one of the things that I think um, separates people who get like a BA on the final exam versus people who don't is uh, people who are able to sort of read the documentation and understand this idea of table spaces. Happy to answer questions that people have about this after you've gone through it, uh, but for now, I'm going to skip that. And this image right here is like the key number one image to understand about, uh, about this entire like section of the class. But if you can understand this image really well, then you will, uh, you'll be in a good position for next week to understand uh, how to make our SQL queries fast. And what this image is talking about, anytime you see this word heap, uh, the heap is referring specifically to this file right here, this file in this uh, folder that represents the actual contents of the, the table. So sometimes you will hear people talk about that as talking about the table. Sometimes they'll be talking about the heap. Uh, and those two things are just interchangeable. This, there is some sort of relation between this heap and the heap data structure in um, like the saw and data structures, but it's a very, very loose relationship. This heap is closer to the idea of a heap in uh, the C programming language, um, but People who've gone through the data science intro courses uh, haven't seen that. Um, but but if, you're, if you uh, did the CS intro courses, then you, then you should have seen that. The way this file is structured, so over here, um, each one of these green blocks is called a page, and every heap table file is just a sequence of pages. Um, the total number of pages that you can have is up to, or the, number, the page identifier is stored with a four byte integer, a four byte unsigned integer. So you can have up to about four billion of these pages. 
each page takes up exactly eight kilobytes. Um, so this 8192 byte is, happens to be eight kilobytes, uh, two to the 12th. And, um, uh, and this is the internal format of one of those pages. Just like the internal format of the tuples had a header, the uh, heap page also has a header. All this blue information right here is referred to as the header. And the header on the heap also takes up exactly 24 bytes. Let's see, where does it say that? Right here. It's a 24 byte long for the header data. Um, for our purposes, we're going to ignore most of these fields, but uh, this PD lower and PD upper will be important. Um, the way the information is actually stored in the heap, um, so each tuple, each row of data starts at the bottom of the heap and, uh, and grows upwards. And so we talked about uh, before spring break about what the data inside one of these tuples is, but this rectangle right here includes all of the uh, header information and the data that uh, we were talking about in that tuple structure before. And uh, it will sort of keep growing until, as you're adding more tuples, keep growing, filling up this white space until you've filled it all up. And at that point, once you fill it all up, a new page will be created and new tuples will be entered into that extra new page. You remember from before that the size of these tuples is variable, that uh, depending on whether you have null entries or not null entries, or um, if you have, say, like text columns, the, end of the number of bytes of a tuple can vary. So the way Postgres knows actually like where the tuples start and end is these line pointers up here. The line pointers actually contain like the, the byte number that this tuple starts at byte 7,000 and this tuple starts at byte uh, 7,500 or whatever those numbers are. The important thing about this is that these line pointers are going to be growing from top to bottom and these uh, tuples down here growing from uh, bottom to top. And uh, this like white space in the middle is called free space or the whole. Those two terms, again, interchangeable with each other. This PD lower uh, refers to the end of the line pointers up here. Um, so that's how Postgres know where, where the free space starts. And this PD upper refers to the beginning of the tuples down here. So that's how no, Postgres knows where the free space ends. And so it can calculate how much free space there is. So if you're trying to insert a tuple, it knows whether it can do it here or it needs to add a new page. Um, we're going to be seeing a lot of variations on this figure as we uh, see how inserts and deletes and updates work. Um, uh, but are there any questions about this figure at this point? Sure. Um, I have a question about the, uh, the disk usage. Sure. Um, so I'm curious how that differs. So if you're calculating the disk usage of the table, how is that, uh, is that different from the row overhead that we were calculating uh, from the midterm? Yeah, great question. The question is, um, how does the row overhead from the midterm uh, relate to this? And so the row overhead that we were talking about is the size of these actual tuples down here. Um, We'll get to chapter five here in a little bit. Here, it's going to have a figure. So we've seen uh, something sort of looking like this before. This is the internal structure of one of those tuples. So this box right here, this full box right here represents one of these individual like tuple one or tuple two boxes. And uh, these first seven fields over here represent the, uh, that header information, that 23 bytes that we were talking about before. And then there's this null, optional null bitmap right here, which uh, can take up uh, one byte or zero bytes or uh, however many, but we have to, to uh, pad it so that the user data is aligned on something divisible by eight. And then the user data right here is the actual, um, the actual information that uh, got, got put in there. And so the, the size of this section right here depends on the types of the columns that we have and the order that they're in. Um, is that answering your question? Yeah. Uh, 
Let's see, let's, let's dig into that a little bit uh, more and see what happens in the uh, size of our data when we actually like start inserting data into this table that we have over here. Um, so let's point out of this. Let's do a real quick select star from T. So there's nothing in this uh, T table at all right now. And uh, because of that, again, we have no bytes stored down here. If we do in inserts, into t values five like this then um, do that real quick we know that the amount of like uh information this tuple is going to take up is going to be uh 24 bytes for the header there's no null bitmap because there's no null value here and then the data itself it's an integer so it'll be four bytes and then in order to make the entire thing uh, padded up to, uh, or divisible by eight, we need the four bytes of padding at the end. And so in total, this is gonna be 32 uh, bytes that this individual tuple takes up. And, uh, but when we now down here, look at the actual disk usage of this table, we'll see that this disk usage is exactly eight kilobytes down here. The reason it's eight kilobytes is because down here, as soon as we insert something into our table, uh, Postgres will realize, okay, there's no pages, so we need to add a page. And every page is exactly eight kilobytes. Doesn't matter how much information's inside of it, it's always gonna be eight kilobytes. And then we've inserted one tuple down here. And so we're gonna have a lot of free space up here. Uh, a little bit more than seven kilobytes of free space. And if I redo this uh, insert, let's just do it with, some different values just for fun like this. Um, all of those, there's still a lot of free space in that page. And so all of these new tuples are gonna be inserted into that free space. And down here, the actual amount of disk space is not going to change at all. Um, so it's still, still eight kilobytes. I'd have to, in order to fill up this page and uh, force Postgres to make a new page, I'd have to make something like 200 different um, of these uh, tuples. So I'm not gonna do that, but if I did do that, then you'd see this go up to 16 and then uh, 24 and 32 and so on as, as the number of pages increases. Any questions about how the heap is stored so far? Okay, um, so yeah, as we're, as we're writing tuples into this structure, um, so here's uh, uh, this figure showing how that process worked. Here we had one line pointer up here pointing to the start of this tuple one right here. And then when we uh, insert a new tuple, this green one right here gets added and this two now points uh, right over here. And, um, and we're slowly filling up this white space. Maybe I didn't mention this before, but um, uh, this is drawn as sort of a rectangle just for convenience, but the ordering is of, of these bytes is it starts on the top left. It's just like you're reading on a page going to the right. And then uh, here it cuts over, comes down here and keeps sort of going across. So this tuple, uh, there's this sort of jump down here, but there's really like no actual physical jump in memory. It's uh, this byte right here is physically right next to this byte inside of memory or on the disk. And um, it was just for convenience of display that it's wrapped around like that. Um, so there's a number of different algorithms for reading from these, uh, these pages. And that's what we're gonna be uh, really focusing on. Uh, when we're talking about how to make our queries fast, how to understand how our queries are interacting with these pages in order to uh, uh, only read the minimum number of pages and the minimum number of tuples possible. The, at this point though, the only algorithm that we'll just talk about is sort of the obvious one called the sequential scan. And what a sequential scan is going to do, so here we have um, two pages, one on top of the other, we have this so the blue header part up here starts the page and then these tuple information down here uh, ends the page. And you can see that this blue line right here is sort of um, 
the direction of information processing. It's basically like a for loop that goes over looking at each one of these uh, tuple pointers right here, uh, looking at each one of these tuples, trying to decide, does it match whatever our query information is? So here, select star means that we're getting everything, so it is going to match, and it's going through all of them just one at a time. Um, these links down here is what we'll be going over again uh, uh, next week about making things fast using these things called indexes and how that will let us essentially jump straight to the particular tuple that we need to answer a query. Um, so, yeah. The main, I guess, takeaway so far is just that if you wanted to scan all of the information, you just, it's basically a for loop over all the pages, and then each page has an internal for loop that goes over all the tuples. Any questions about any of that? Yes. Uh, the question is like, what is this one? Yeah. Uh, so the reason they have this one right here is that this one just uh, tells you that the information inside of this line pointer right here corresponds to tuple one. Oh, so this two corresponds to tuple two. It's not like the actual number is stored there. Oh. This is the, the information corresponds to this tuple. The, the actual uh, information that's stored here is a, um, uh, I'm not sure about the entire, entirety of the information, but part of the information is a two-bit integer that says, like, what is the number of bytes that the next tuple starts at? Um, so Postgres, in order to know, like, where tuple one is physically located in the page, it just looks at this position right here, and that tells it that byte 7,500 is where you look for, for tuple one. Um, did that help? Yeah, no. Um, good question. Any other questions so far? Okay. Um, so that was the overview of this first chapter. The second chapter uh, is a, a particularly short one, um, and there's not too much uh, important information here. Uh, but it's just going over the different processes that are involved in Postgres uh, to do different things. And uh, I mentioned before a long time ago that one of the differences between Postgres and other databases like MySQL is that Postgres uses this uh, operating system concept called a process uh, to make all of its things parallel, whereas MySQL uses threads. Uh, processes are more safe than threads because they don't a crash in one doesn't cause everything to crash. Um, and so this is a background on just what all of these different processes are doing. Most of these processes are related to those other branches of the tree uh, that we're, we're not gonna talk about. And I'm referring to the tree, I mean this tree right here. Um, each one of these boxes basically has its own process that's, that's related to it. Um, but, uh, the main, the main thing that's important for us is that every time a new client connects to Postgres, a new Postgres backend process is going to be created. So there's one Postgres process for every, every individual client. Um, yeah, the, uh, at different times, uh, things will come up related to these uh, variables right here especially when we start talking about the uh, making your queries fast. Uh, these variables here affect how much memory different areas of the processes have available to them. And uh, so at this point, we won't talk about this, but uh, just keep this like in the back of your mind that uh, you'll need to be able to reference this when we're talking about memory configuration parameters. And that's uh, for, for this whole section. Super brief, any questions about that? Okay, um, 
This chapter five is uh, a particularly complicated chapter. And again, this is a chapter that, uh, so it's focusing on concurrency control and really focusing on the implementation of concurrency control. And so if this were a computer science class, then we would be going over like every one of these lines in super detail. Um, but since this is a, the data science version of the class, we're gonna be talking about the applications. And so uh, I'm gonna be highlighting which sections here are important and which ones are not important. Um, but first of all, all of the, uh, uh, the different, um, uh, sort of bolded terms, definitions, things that you should be aware of. Uh, so snapshot isolation, that's the particular name of the technique that Postgres uses in order to implement the multi-version concurrency control. You'll see this SI uh, referenced throughout, uh, not just this book, but like documentation all over the internet. And uh, when you see that, that just means that that's referring to how Postgres actually implements things. Uh, so here's the like summary of the isolation levels that we started talking about uh, last week. Um, this is just uh, repeating one of the tables from the uh, the documentation here. And now we're going to uh, talk a little bit about how Postgres is actually implementing the idea of isolation that uh, that the PDF uh, from last week was talking about. And so I think hopefully our discussion about this will help you understand a little bit more about, um, about how, yeah, how, uh, yeah, about the things that we talked about last week. Uh, maybe make it a little bit more concrete. And um, so what I wanna do, I'm gonna come back over here and I'm gonna, let's get two Postgres sessions open. There we go. And so these, both these Postgres sessions open up uh, so we have the same uh, table over here, uh, the same table T, select star from T, let's do a backslash DT up here so we can see just the, the schema has this column A up here. And so uh, we've seen before that if I do something like select A from T, we'll get the list of all of the different values inside of this table. And then if I had some like different column name like B, we're gonna get an error message about that column doesn't exist. It turns out though in Postgres, um, so this, this table that we saw, or this figure that we saw down here, each one of these hidden sort of uh, header variables are things that you can access actually directly from within Postgres. And so down over here, if I do a select X min from T, X min here is not a column inside of T, uh, so Similar to B, it's not a column, but in this case, it, it actually works, it actually exists. And so this is one of those pieces of the uh, header from each one of these rows. And so I'm gonna do x min comma x max comma c t i d comma a like this. And so here the a is the, um, the particular values that we've inserted. And then these columns right here are some of the just some of the header pieces of information. The CTID, this is gonna be a super critical one um, to, uh, to make sure that you uh, fully understand. So with this uh, CTID uh, is, is it's the, uh, what it stands for is the tuple ID. So sometimes you'll see it called CTID, sometimes you'll see it just called TID, and that stands for the tuple ID. And this is the, like, the physical location on the hard drive that this tuple is represented at. The very first number, leftmost number is the page number, and the rightmost number is the tuple number in that page. So we've inserted three different values right here. Um, so these are the three different uh, tuple IDs that, that we have access to. If I come back over to our, um, heap image, where did it go? It's this one, there we go. Here, um, so this tuple 
right here. Uh, if this is the very first page, uh, it would be page zero. So then this tuple ID would be zero comma one. And this tuple ID right here would be zero comma two. Uh, so this again, physical location on the, um, on the hard drive that the information is stored. Anytime you see an X inside of a column, the X stands for transaction. So X equals transaction. And so this uh, X min and X max, the way to read it is the transaction min and transaction max. And we'll talk just a little bit about what those mean here in a second. Question? So because you can reference these columns, um, are these are those columns off like naming them? Like when you say the table, you're trying to name the column. Yeah, good question. Um, so the question is, can we do something like create table u of uh, x min int like this? And the answer is no, because it conflicts with the system column name. Um, so yeah, it's, uh, um, I think they, they tried to name these things so that they'd be like, things that you probably wouldn't want to name things, but um, it, it does turn out that there are some columns that you just can't name at that. Uh, good question. Any other questions? Okay. So what I want to do is I want to start two transactions. Here, begin and begin. And in both of the transactions, I want to run this select statement up here. Like this. And you see that we have the, the same information in both of these transactions. Uh, but now what I want to do is I want to, up here, let's do a delete from T where A equals six, something like this. So this corresponding to this row right here, this row is going to be deleted. And rerun this command, and we'll see that uh, this row is in fact deleted. And you'll notice uh, that the, uh, none of the tuples like move. This uh, seven right here uh, stays at position zero three, and this five at position zero one, but uh, nothing moves around. And down here, um, I'm going to rerun this command as well. And we're going to see sort of what happens, what changes. I hit Enter. And you can see that before the, before the x max over here was uh, 0. Uh, down here, the x max has changed to uh, 738. Um, so we were talking before about transaction isolation, how uh, we're not supposed to be able to see the effects of a transaction until we hit commit. Um, so up here, I've not committed this transaction. So that's why down here, uh, row six still exists. Uh, but if you look at these system columns, the system columns do break isolation. System columns do break the isolation property of Postgres. Um, and so when you're like uh, code, you should never, uh, yeah, we're talking about these system columns right now so that we have a, an understanding of what they're doing when we start talking about the making Postgres fast information. Uh, but like in your code inside of Python and application in any way, you would never want to be like directly relying on any of these system column values. Um, if you see people doing that, then there's some sort of uh, like very deep black magic going on that uh, you don't want to mess with. Uh, but the way Postgres knows like whether a particular row, we'd say whether the row is visible or not visible, is by a complicated computation that involves this x min and this x max and what your current transaction ID is. If we come over uh, here, let's go down to uh, these notes down here. Um, so inside, right now I'm on the GitHub file. The, the things that are contained in the, the GitHub file are sort of the uh, Know, the most important things to make sure that you fully understand about this section. Uh, but it has this, uh, this command right here, which can tell us what exactly our current transaction ID is. And so if I run that command up here, we'll get our transaction ID is 738. So here, this x max, we see 738. 
and uh, where, whoops, run that command down here. Uh, oh, I'm not inside of a transaction, I guess, begin. Oh. Uh, so because I've not actually run like any uh, insert statements, um, I don't have a transaction ID assigned inside this transaction. This command right here, get transaction ID if assigned, says only get the number if, if it exists. If I run an insert command, insert into T, values will do 10 like that. Now I have a transaction ID assigned, 739. Run the, there we go, that up here. Here's our uh, uh, transaction 739 uh, down here. X min is set to the uh, particular transaction that actually inserted a, a particular row. Because this uh, X max over here, X max uh, 738, when we deleted it up here, was uh, is 738, and this transaction is 739. It knows that uh, this row is. Um, uh, sorry, let's talk about this bottom row down here. Um, this row down here has a trend X min of 739. And so in order to see this particular uh, transaction right here, you need to have a uh, transaction ID that is at least as big as 739. Up here, this transaction ID is not as big as 739. And so when I uh, run this, Postgres knows that this uh, this row down here is not yet visible. Um, so these uh, X min and X max used to actually determine uh, whether a particular row is visible or not visible. The computations for determining that are extremely complicated. I want to just um, come down here to the if statements that talk about this. Um, so the visibility check rules. Uh, if you see this phrase visibility check, that means determining whether a transaction is, uh, or whether a row is something that you can see inside of your current transaction. And there's a lot of different rules for how, whether something is visible or not. So you can see these giant like chains of uh, if and else, all of these things are satisfied, then the row is visible or not visible. Again, if this were a computer science class, we'd be going into the details of all of that. Um, we're not gonna go into the details of all of that though. The important thing is just, the thing that you need to know is that every transaction is going to have a transaction ID. So I'll type it out. Every transaction has an X ID. Every row references the X ID of the creating, I'll use the actual commands, the insert, delete, update command that added it. Um, and th so uh, those are the, like, the two key important uh, pieces of information. Those XIDs are used to determine visibility. Are there any questions? Yes, Dustin. Yeah. When we put like within how many transactions, right? Um, you did the begin, you know, if you were to insert another uh, value in the current transaction, would it still have the same XID? Oops. Um, uh, yes, it will. So here I had a syntax typo. I didn't say which table, so uh, it's. Um, uh, broke the transaction. Once you have an error in your, in a transaction in any form, every future um, command is going to fail. Insert into t values ten. See that it fails because it's aborted because we already had an error. So I have to abort here. Let's begin again. Insert into the v values ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen. So four values created with the same transaction. And then select, there we go. We'll see that those four uh, rows right here all have the same transaction ID 740. Um, good question, any other questions about the transaction IDs? Yeah, 
Yeah, so X min is the transaction that inserted the row. X max is the transaction that deleted the row. Um, an update is just implemented by a delete followed by an insertion. So if I were to update a row, say do something like update uh, t set uh, a equals to 20, where a equals 10. So that'll modify this row right here. Uh, what we'll see is that, um, and let's, I'm gonna uh, commit this transaction up here, begin, run this select, uh, yeah, we didn't commit down here, so it doesn't, can't see this. Let's, control C, commit down here. I wanna be able to see all of those uh, rows down here, and in particular, this, uh, this row right here. And now if we begin a transaction, update t set a equals 20, where a equals 10, that's going to affect this row right here. And what it's going to do is it's going to delete this row, uh, but it's only like a logical delete. It's going to update the uh, x max of this row to indicate that it's been called with a delete on it. And then it's going to call a subsequent insert. And we'll see that by up here, the x max has been set to this particular transaction ID for this particular row here. And then uh, down here, when I run this command again, we'll see that we don't see the 10 up here because it's, it's not visible to this transaction because we've deleted it. Uh, but we do see this 20 down here um, at this new different location. So anytime you run an update command, it doesn't actually like modify anything on the disk. It just marks that particular tuple as having been deleted in this particular transaction by setting the x max value to uh, that transaction ID and then um, creating another, uh, another separate tuple down here. Did that answer your question somewhere in there? Yeah, so then the question is like, what is the use of marking the x max? And the answer is that these complicated formulas down here, they check to see properties about um, what is the value of x min or what is the value of x max and use that to determine whether the row is visible for your particular transaction. Um, yeah, so the actual like formulas that it uses for that, it's these really complicated chains of if else statements. Uh, and so for our purposes, we don't need to be able to like specifically determine from those two numbers whether something's visible or not. Uh, but if you wanted to, this, is, this would be how you would do it. You would go through these checks, these if else statements, uh, to see if something's visible or not to your transaction. Yeah, the, the important information is that these two columns right here determine whether something's visible or not, uh, but we don't care yet, or we, don't, we won't care in this class how it determines that. Did that answer your question? Any other questions? So yeah, maybe two other like highlight, highlights of this is that a delete does not physically delete from the, uh, the disk. It just marks the, or changes the x max value. And sometimes we would call this a logical delete rather than a physical delete. A physical delete meaning like actually modifying the data on the hard drive. And then related to that is that an update is implemented as uh, a delete followed by an insert. Um, and, the, and the actual like code inside of Postgres for update is literally just call the delete function, then call the insert function. Uh, so there is no difference between uh, an update and a delete followed by an insert. So a corollary to that is that an update does not modify data on disk. It just marks the old tuple as deleted and adds a new, new tuple.
And again, the X min and X max in the complicated formulas determine whether that is visible or not visible. Uh, so what would be like a physical delete? Uh, question is, so what would be a physical delete? And uh, if uh, there's a procedure called vacuum, which we will um, talk about, um, vacuuming does the physical delete, but there's no way to actually specifically say, like, I want this tuple physically deleted right now. Um, cannot manually physically delete a tuple uh, or modify a tuple because if you were able to do that, that would break all of the acid guarantees of Postgres. Uh, so this has a bunch of like really good properties from a computer science perspective of ensuring that our data is going to, uh, ensuring our data integrity ensuring our data consistency, ensuring that what we insert into the database is going to be available to the appropriate uh, transactions. Um, but it, it results in potentially a bunch of uh, overhead. So let's commit all our current transactions, and run this. And you can see that, so we currently have tuples going up to position 0, 0,9 up here. But we also have a handful of uh, tuple ID positions that don't correspond to any actual visible tuples anymore. And there is no transaction. There's no transaction that can see the tuples at positions. Uh, so in this case, it's 0, 0,2. Uh, that we, we had a 0, 0,2 that had the sixth value for A before. Uh, but we deleted that and uh, committed our transactions. And so these are the only two transactions that exist. None of them can see that. So there is no transaction that can see that. Um, similarly, for uh, positions four and five right here, there are no transactions that can uh, physically see those, those tuples. Zero 02, zero 04, and zero 05. And so we call these dead tuples. And uh, uh, a table with a lot of dead tuples is referred to as a bloated table. Um, bloated because it's, uh, those tuples exist. They're taking up disk space. We can't just directly put more, uh, more tuples inside of this page at those locations. And uh, and so that's, that's table bloat, referring to just like physically wasted disk space. In this case, though, we're still going to be sitting inside of a, a single page. And so there's no, um, we haven't run into any downsides of, of having these dead tuples. They're not actually using more disk space. We're still stuck at the eight kilobytes of disk space usage. Um, yeah, well, let's see. So the next important thing for us to talk about is this chapter on um, uh, vacuuming is chapter six. And uh, vacuuming, again, is the process of actually removing these uh, dead tuples. So down here, I'm going to run the command vacuum t like this and hit enter. So it'll be a really fast process because there's uh, very few tuples in this table. But potentially, the vacuum process uh, can be an extremely, extremely slow process if you have a very bloated table. So I've run the vacuum process, and now I want to rerun this command up here that uh, was showing me the information about the like, physical location of all the tuples. And I'll do it down here so that we can compare uh, the two things at the same time. But I would get the same uh, information no matter which of these two sessions I, I run it in. I hit enter, and um, the um, I made a slight guess here that I was wrong about these uh, tuple IDs. The numbers didn't actually change, but they did get uh, rearranged on the disk. 
Um, so I'm going to jump over to this, the images over here to explain what vacuum is doing. And the key thing about this uh, chapter six here is this, uh, uh, this figure right here. So we have uh, this, uh, this page header right here. This tuple two was a dead tuple that we had before. And um, so we have uh, originally three tuples. Somehow this middle tuple here got deleted. The X max got adjusted, so it's no longer visible. And so it's wasting uh, disk space as it is. And so when we did the vacuum process, what uh, happened is these pointers up here, the one, two, and three, they stayed how they are. Uh, so we still have tuples one, two, and three, but tuple two was physically deleted from this page, freeing up the space that tuple two used to occupy. So now we have tuple one and uh, tuple three here inside of this, inside of this page. Uh, so vacuum is going to delete these dead tuples right here. It's not going to change their tuple IDs though. Um, so that's why over here, these tuple IDs after running vacuum, same as the tuple IDs from before running vacuum. Um, but we do have more free space actually in the page now. Any questions so far? I will uh, jump ahead real quick to the vacuum full command, since that'll, will change the, the tuple IDs. Um, one of the things that a vacuum does is it considers only tuple or each page individually by itself. So here we have uh, a table with three pages inside of it. And um, when we run the vacuum, it's, so this is a very bloated table. There's a lot of uh, dead tuples inside of here. When we run the vacuum, it uh, deletes all of those dead tuples uh, like this. But what a vacuum does not do is it does not combine pages together. It does not sort of like reconsider the table from scratch. It only works on a page by page basis. The vacuum full uh, is, is different than that. The vacuum full will actually um, create an entirely new table and then progressively insert tuples into that table one at a time like this in order to uh, shrink the pages together. Over here, I'm gonna run the vacuum full command like that and now rerun this. And now because it actually like reconsidered the, uh, the, the page, all the inserts tuples from scratch, now we have that these uh, tuple IDs, they've uh, uh, all been shrunk down to their minimum possible values. So the, uh, the vacuum full is going to be the, uh, yeah, the key, the key difference between the vacuum and the vacuum full, again, vacuum operating on a page by page basis. So it will remove dead tables, will give you more free space in the table that you're able to insert with. Uh, so it's a very good thing, um, but it's not going to actually reduce the disk space usage. Uh, the disk space usage is determined by the total number of table, the total number of pages you have in your table. And so a vacuum command will not change the number of pages. It will not, a vacuum command will never give you disk space back. A vacuum full command will change the number of uh, pages. And so it will give you disk space back. It's significantly slower though, because it has to uh, basically reconstruct things from scratch and consider the entire table at once. Any questions about, yes, Joey? Uh, if the vacuum doesn't um, give vacuum the disk space, what's the motivation for using it? Question is great question. The question is what exactly is the motivation for using the vacuum? Uh, next class we'll uh, talk about this in a little bit more detail. Um, but here, if if you imagine we have this situation right here, where um, we have this really bloated table, and now we want to insert a new tuple, then there's no space in any of these three pages to insert a new tuple because we can't overwrite a dead tuple when we're doing an insert. And so we'll have to create a new page and insert into that new page. 
But if we do a vacuum, then um, it's going to create this free space by deleting these dead tuples. And uh, then uh, we'll be able to just insert directly into this page without creating a new page. So doing the vacuum will uh, make inserts more efficient. We'll also talk about, um, again, next week when we're talking about the different algorithms for select queries, we'll see that all of those different algorithms, they actually have to like process all of these dead tuples. So every dead tuple that you have in your table is going to slow down all of your select queries. You could have a table that only has one particular row in it, um, but if it has a billion dead tuples inside of it, because you've done a lot of deletes, then it's going to be extremely slow whenever you run a select query. And running the vacuum command will delete all those uh, dead tuples and make those other queries fast. Uh, yeah, vacuum. Uh, vacuuming is so important that Postgres has this process called auto vacuum. And uh, uh, tuning auto vacuum so that it vacuums things correctly is uh, turns out to be one of the uh, main tasks of like a database administrator at a major company like Instagram that is uh, using Postgres in, in their back end for uh, storing all their information. Um, yeah, I think uh, this is a good time for us to, uh, I think, pause our discussion of auto vac uh, vacuuming and auto vacuuming. Um, we can't get into any more real details about it in the time we have left. Uh, but that's just a teaser, teaser I guess, about uh, next class. We'll be talking in more detail about these vacuuming tools, uh, what they do, and then we'll probably also next class start the actual discussion of making the SQL queries fast. Any, any last questions for today? Okay, then um, hope you all have a good rest of your day.